Hi, and welcome to this tutorial on conformance checking in pm 4 uh, What is conformance checking? In conformance checking, we use a process model that represents um, the execution of a process in the sense that it represents the way in which we want a process to behave. And we take event data that is coming from the view execution of a uh, process in reality. And we try to assess to what degree does the reality as reflected by the event data, to what degree does it conform to the model, the reference model that we have that represents the uh, process. Um, I'm going to be uh, using an example um, that I've been using before in other tutorials, um, which is a process uh, related to um, uh, requests for compensation. Um, the model uh, that we are using, so the um, representation of the process um, and the specification of the behavior that we want the process to follow is, is what you see in, in this image here. This is a BPMN model. Um, and it states that first um, the request should be registered after which there is a, a concurrent slash parallel execution of checking the tickets and a thorough or casual examination. You can see that uh, in the middle of the process after which the decision is made. And then finally, we can either reinitiate the request and, and start over with the checks and the examination, or we have a payment of the compensation or a rejection of the request. Those are the outcomes that are possible. Um, I'm going to be using this as a running example. And as I said, this is going to be the model. So this is the way in which we want our process to behave. Um, and the first technique that I'm going to show you is a token-based replay, which is implemented in pm 4 pi um, And before I show you how to invoke it, I will try to explain what token-based replay actually does. And I'm going to use an example, Petrinet, um, that is exactly representing the same behavior as the process model that I've shown you before. Um, um, so it's it's a different modeling notation. It's the BPMN notation uh, that we've seen before, but it represents the exact same behavior of the process. So in general, how do you uh, how are you supposed to look at Petri nets? In Petri nets, you see um, two types of nodes. Uh, also known as vertices. So two types of nodes, you see circles and you see uh, rectangles. Um, the circles I will now um, refer to as a place or places. So when I talk about a place, I'm referring to the circles that you see. And the, uh, the, the rectangles um, are um, known as transitions. So the, um, for example, we have the register request transition represented by this triangle here. Uh, sorry, this um, a rectangle here with the register request inside. Um, when you look at such a model as a graph, so for those people that have a background in graph theory, um, it's a bipartite model, a bipartite graph, which means that uh, you can separate its nodes into two separate classes. And those classes are only allowed to connect to members of the other class, but you are not allowed to have intra connections between members of the same class. Um, and if you look carefully, you see that this is the case. Um, what do I mean with this? Circles, AKA places, only connect to rectangles, AKA transitions. So you'll never see in a pattern net an arc um, going from a circle slash place to another place. This, you won't see that happening. And similarly, you will never ever see um, a square or rectangle connected to another rectangle. So it's a bipartite graph where places are the one class and the transitions are the other class. Um, <clears throat> the places are used to represent the state of the process that the PetriNet is modeling. Um, and such state is actually represented by what we call an assignment of tokens to places. And if you look at this net, this pattern net, you see that the leftmost place here, I'm drawing now a arrow below, uh, that, that place actually contains one uh, black dot, which is known as a token. Um, and let's say if this place would be called P1, place one, P1 in this Petri net, 
Um, then we would say the state of this uh, of this battery net um, is one token in place P1. Now, <clears throat> in fact, uh, we call such a assignment, so an assignment of these tokens to those um, different places. We uh, refer to that as uh, a marking. So a marking is an arbitrary assignment of tokens to places. I can add another token to this place. And then I would have two tokens in place P1. That is possible. It's a different marking compared to one token in P1. And I could add a token here. And again, if I would have a new marking, two tokens in P1. And if this would be place P2, then I would have a token in P1, uh, a token in P2 as well. So for the mathematically inclined, marking is usually represented as a multi-set, where if you know the concept of a set, a multi-set is a generalization that allows members to occur more than one time. And the marking that I've just drawn here would be two tokens in P1, so two times P1 and one times P2. So that would be the marking that I've drawn here. So those are markings. So markings are assignments of these black dots into the places of this pattern. Um, now, as you can imagine, given the name transition, these uh, transitions that are represented by uh, squares, um, they uh, or a rectangle, sorry, they allow us to manipulate the state of a, a net, actually the marking. Um, and actually, um, there's one general rule that applies to those petri nets um, for being able to um, manipulate marking. And that rule basically states that you can only um, use a transition, which we call firing a transition, but you can only use a transition. It's only enabled and it can be activated if all of the places that connect to the transition by means of an arc coming from the place into the transition, all those places, which we call the pre-places of such a transition, have to contain a token. Um, and in exactly one token in, in this example. So, or at least one token, sorry. So um, that means that in the current marking, there's exactly one transition that has this condition met, right? There's one condition, transition which all for which all places in its preset have at least one token. And namely that is the register request transition because there's only one place in its preset that is place P1. And you can see P1 contains a token. If I look at any other uh, transition, let's take a look at the check ticket transition. Then if we look at its places in its preset, which would be only this place, you see that place does not contain a token, hence the check ticket enable, uh, transition cannot be fired in this marking. Um, if I would add a token here, that would change. So if I would add a token here, so I would now say, um, let's let's put a token there, let's call this uh, marking, uh, this place P4, let's call this place above P3. Um, there's a token in uh, P4 now, and all of a sudden uh, we see now that um, the check, trick, check ticket transition is in fact enabled. Um, if I would uh, add also numbers to the places uh, on the left of the decide transition here, right? So we have a transition called decide here. Um, in the current marking, so one token in P1 and one token in P4, in the current marking, this is not enabled, right? Because the places that are in the preset of the decide transition, those are those two places over here, P5 and P6. And both of them in this marking, they don't contain a token. If I would add a token in uh, P6, still, the decide transition would not be enabled because it's not the case that all places in its preset contain at least one token, right? P5 is also in its preset, P5 does not contain a token. And it doesn't matter if I add another token to P6, 
I now have two uh, tokens in P6. Still, this side is unable. It's not enabled. Only if I would now also put a token in P5, uh, now this side would be enabled because now every place in the preset of the decide transition contains at least one one token. Um, so in this marking. Um, we could argue that, or we, we could state in this current marking, which has one token in P1, one token in P4, one token in P5, and two tokens in P6, we have three enabled transitions, namely the register request, because there's a token in P1, the check ticket, because there's a token in P4, and the decide transition, because there's both at least a token in P5 and at least a token in P6. Now, as I said, enabled transitions, they can fire. If we decide to fire a transition that is enabled and we can pick any of the enabled transitions we like, um, they will consume one token from every place in its preset, exactly one token, and they will produce a token per place in their um, post set. So the the places that connect to them at the other end. For example, the post set of the register request transition is the set containing just only the place P2, right? Um, that's the post set of uh, re register request. So if I decide to fire the register request transition, it will remove this token that was initially in P1. I cannot wipe it because it's part of the, the image underneath, but imagine it's no longer there. As I said, it consumes that token and it will produce a token in P2. So from the previous marking, remember the previous marking was one token in P1, one token in P4, one token in P5, and two tokens in P6. Firing the registered request transition yields a new marking, which is one token in P2, one token in P4, one token in P5, and two tokens in P6. Um, that's the effect of firing the register request transition in the previous marking. Um, and the only thing that's extremely important to always keep in the back of your mind is the fact that um, tokens only live um, in the places that they are produced in. And at the moment they are consumed by any transitions, their life ends. So, and the life starts at production. So even though you might have the conceptual idea that the token flows from P1 to P2, this is actually not how you should infer this firing of a transition. Rather, you would have to see, a, see it as follows. Like from the moment you register request, you execute a register request, the token from P1 basically is dead and a new fresh token is produced in, in P2. So there's no, in that sense, there's no relation between production and consumption. It's a very in, important fundamental rule. And it's very, um, let's say natural to think of it a bit in a wrong way. As I said, to think of it more as this token flows from P1 to P2, that's, that's a false reasoning. It's really about when we consume the token, it ceases its existence. And when we produce a token, its existence starts. So let's continue the example. Um, what we see here is that, let me call this transition here, this, this leftmost black transition, let's call that transition T1, right? So <clears throat> in the current marking, so we have one token in P2, one token in P4, one token in P5, and two tokens in P6. So in the current marking, we observe again, there's three transitions enabled, namely T1, check ticket, and decide. Now you might wonder why is there this black transition? I haven't explained that yet. Those transitions are what we call invisible transitions. Those are transitions that we can fire, but firing them would not allow any environment that can see what's going on in the system to observe any activity being performed. So if we fire this register request transition that we just did, we assume that we could somehow in the environment observe this. So if we would register an event log out of firing these transitions, we would actually observe that we have fired the register request activity. But if we would decide to fire any of these two black colored transitions, uh, we would not see any observable thing. So in um, 
uh, in automata theory, these type of transitions are often uh, referred to as tau transitions. <clears throat> now let's uh, again play the token game. Um, let's let's assume that we uh, are going to fire T1 because observe it's enabled because all uh, the members of its preset, which is only place P2, have um, a token in the place connected to it. So if I fire T1, I will consume the token in P2 and I will produce a new fresh token in P3 and I will also push a beautiful fresh new token in P4. So now, again, from the previous marking, which was one token in P2, one token in P4, one token in P5, and two tokens in P6, by firing this invisible transition T1, which will, which is able to manipulate the marking of the mark net that we have, but it's not, we're not able to see that somehow in the environment, we obtain a new marking, um, which is one token in P3, two tokens in P4, one token in P5, uh, two tokens in P6. So, and you can see actually that these um, these transitions, these black transitions, which we also refer to as a silent transition, they are usually used in modeling like business-like processes for two reasons, skipping things. So enabling us to optionally do certain activities or um, uh, branching or merging parallel blocks. Right, so actually here T1 is actually a, a branching of, of a parallel block. So after firing T1, all of a sudden, you now also notice that examine thoroughly, examine casually, and check tickets, those three transitions, including the side transition, are now enabled in this current marking, right? However, if I would fire the check ticket uh, transition, which I can fire twice, uh, actually, because I have two tokens in P4, uh, that will not influence uh, anything related to the examination, um, uh, the examination uh, transitions, right? So, in a more general, um, in a more general sense, if you have two transitions or k transitions in that, for the matter, but let's assume you have two transitions that are both enabled, but they don't share any input places, you know that you can fire them um, independently of one another, and that's exactly the case here between check ticket and the two examination. Um, uh, transitions. Note, however, that the examine thoroughly and the examine casually, those two transitions, they uh, are both enabled, right? Because P3 is in the preset. Um, so they're both enabled because P3 contains token. However, they share this preset. And in fact, I can either decide to fire the examine thoroughly or the examine casually um, transition. I can take one of them. And when I do that, let's say I fire the examine thoroughly, I remove the token from P3 and I push the token into P5. And so that in, sort of implies that by firing the examine thoroughly, I will block firing examine casually and the other way around. So that's an exclusive decision that I have to make um, uh, in this case, right? So uh, that's an exclusive choice. Um, so I'm going to revert this decision right now. So I'm going to put the token back in, in, in a token back in P3, um, right? So often, if you see transitions with multiple outgoing arcs, you know this is type, a type of construct that starts to generate parallel behavior because things can happen completely at the same time and completely independent of one another. If you see places with multiple outgoing arcs, you typically observe and I have to state that this is the case generally for business processes in particular, but also generically for pettiness. When you see places that have multiple outgoing arcs, that typically signifies that there's some form of uh, choice um, going on. Also in the classical sense of pattern theory is sometimes referred to as conflict. Um, now, uh, another final example, which is interesting to show you is in the current marking, as I said, uh, the decide transition is also enabled. Um, if it fires, it will take from all places in the preset, it will take one token, right? So if we fire decide, we will take a token from P5, we will take a token from P6, and we will produce one token for every outgoing arc. So again, I want to stress how this works. Um, 
And it again shows if we fire the side uh, transition from the previous marking, you really see there is no such thing as uh, a flow of tokens, right? It takes two tokens and it kills both tokens and produces a new token. So it's not the case that even though you take two tokens uh, to fire the side, that it will also produce two tokens at the end. That would again imply some form of flow of these tokens, which is not the case. So that's basically... In a nutshell, the firing rule of Petronas. And I'm going to now wipe away some of the tokens and some of my drawings uh, in the in this um, in this net. Um, and I want you to, to finally take note of a specific uh, thing here, um, which is that in this case I have an initial marking that contains one token. Now, this specific path net that we see here is actually uh, also known as a workflow net, but I will not go into the details why this is belonging to that class of path nets. Um, but this, this, this net that you see here has some nice desirable behavioral properties. Um, for example, uh, it has the property, uh, which is known as uh, one boundedness or safeness, that at any point in time, if you start arbitrarily firing any transition that is enabled, you'll never have any place in the net. When you start with one token in P1, you'll never have any place in the net that contains more than one token. So essentially, um, this, this marking that I've just drawn where we would have like two tokens in P6 or something like that or whatever, that's not possible if you start uh, by... Um, basically by putting one token in P1. I, you'll never you'll never reach such a marking where there's more than one token in a, in a place. And uh, another, another property which is really nice is um, this net has a unique deadlock. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, a deadlock generally is simply a marking in which there is no more transition enabled. So for example, if we would assume uh, this token in P1 would be, not be there and I would have only a token in P5, uh, then we would be in a deadlock state. So if we have a marking where there's only one token in P5, then we have a deadlock state because the decide transition is not enabled because there's no token in P6, right? Um, and if you, obviously, if you would actually start from the marking where there is um, a token in P1 and, and, and you would then start firing, then you would notice that I can never reach this marking where it's just a token in P5 because there should always be a token in either P4 or P6. That's that's a condition, actually, for when we start from uh, marking P1. And the only deadlock state, so the only deadlock state in which nothing can happen is this place in the, the right here, which is generally referred to as the sync place of the work format. And that's really nice because that means that um, there's this very clear notion of termination of this particular model. Um, right, so this is very important to take in the back of your mind. So now we've... Um, and, and and these type of properties are generally, and sometimes you can use a bit weaker properties, but these type of properties are generally preferable when you do um, compliance and conformance checking of, of process models um, uh, and event data. And um, it's also good to understand why I'm, I'm showing you, by the way, pattern is because usually under the hood, models like the BPMN model that I've shown you previously will actually be transformed into these type of nets. Um, okay, so far, uh, so good. Uh, let's now focus on um, the token-based replay algorithm, which essentially uses exactly this whole machinery that I've just explained um, to verify whether or not an observed uh, behavioral sequence fits with respect to a process model. So for example, let's assume that um, the register request examine casually, check ticket, decide, reject request, that sequence would be observed in the event data. So the event data would describe that there's an instance of this process that follows this nice, beautiful pattern. So what would token-based replay do? It would try to mimic this behavior. And it does it in a bit of a heuristic way. So it's going to say, let's start with the initial marking of this net, which was the token in this place, P1. Now let's simply assume, uh, let's find the transition that has that label. That's this one. 
And let's fire it. Okay. Um, we can do that, right? So if we if we take the token from there and we produce a new token here, we have successfully mimicked the register request uh, trans, uh, activity in the trace. So this one is done, right? And it's correct. Now we need to fire the examine casually transition. That's uh, that's over here, right? Um, then modern token-based replay techniques, the, the, the original algorithm wouldn't be able to, to understand that, that um, it could directly fire it after uh, using this invisible transition, but modern token-based replay techniques would be able to say, well, um, I can actually enable this by simply uh, firing this uh, invisible transition T1 here, which is enabled, right? So I would fire that. I would not uh, record that in the system. Uh, we'll get into this marking here. Great. And now I would be able to uh, also mimic the examine casually. That's great. So whoop. And if I fire examine casually, I end up with a token there. And we check the next activity in the trace. Ah, check ticket. Well, that's directly enabled. I can mimic that. And also that one is done. Decide, same same story here. Ah, it's directly enabled. So it will consume those two tokens and produce a single token here. New one. And we've parsed decide. And then finally, again, it would realize if it has to enable the reject request. It would need to fire the second invisible transition to get a token here. Um, and then it would say, yeah, I can fire reject request. Let's enable it. And I would actually be in the only unique deadlock state of this work for that. Great. So it would find out that actually this trace that I've written below, reject request, examine casually, check ticket, decide, and reject request perfectly fits with respect to um, the model. Um, now let's assume that we have a trace, reject request, examine casually, check ticket, reject uh, reg uh, reject request. So what we can already see from just you know playing with this model and, 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 and reasoning on the behavior, we can already see that the decision, uh, the decide um, transition is not enabled. Um, what would token base uh, it's not used sorry the decide transition is not used so what would token based replay do it would again start um, looking at the first activity and trying to see can I directly play it yes I can and I reach this marking that's all good so register requests satisfied the examine casually it would again observe okay I need to fire this first invisible transition get into this uh, state here and then I can fire examine casually great and I get into the marking here. Uh, this marking is the new marking we reach. Check ticket, enabled. But then it would observe a problem. It would say, hey, I need to do the reject request. What the algorithm is not able to do is fire transitions with a label to ultimately uh, reach the marking that you want. So theoretically, of course, what we could do is we could fire this side and then fire this silent transition there. And then we would get into a marking that um, would be um, the marking we need to eventually find the reject request transition. But it cannot do that. So it cannot touch the decide at all. Um, so what it would say is it would say, um, let's see if I can uh, use, um, well, I'll, I wanted to use a different color, but it's fine like this. What it will do is it will say, OK, I can now add a token in this place. So I will add a token in this place. And, but I will keep track, which uh, I will put a counter on the number of tokens that are missing. So number of tokens that were missing during the execution, during the mimicking, I would say, of this trace. So it would put a token there. It would say this token was missing. And now I've put the token there. Now I can fire the reject request. So I'm going to take it away. And then, OK, I would actually put a token in this place here, which is also represented a bit different to, to denote that it's the only deadlock state in this pattern. Um, but then 
it would um, generally also observe that uh, there would be a token remaining here and there would be a token remaining here. So, and that's essentially what token-based replay does. What I didn't explain is that during the whole uh, replay that I've just been showing you, it also keeps track of the number of tokens produced and consumed. So it has actually four counters. It has produced, consumed, uh, missing and remaining tokens. And uh, if you have no missing and remaining tokens, the algorithm will tell you that it's a perfectly fitting trace because nothing was missing and nothing was remaining um, and everything is fine. So you get a fitness value of one. However, if you have certain tokens remaining or there were certain tokens missing, this will have a, have a negative impact on your fitness score. I'm not going to explain that in full depth. Um, you can look, for example, at the, the Coursera MOOC uh, of Professor van der Aust, where I think he explains in, in also a, a bit more detail how that um, specific computation goes, but I, I think it's a bit of outside of the scope of this uh, tutorial here. Um, but that's in a nutshell what um, what what token-based replay does. So it's basically trying to replay, that's why it's called token-based replay, trying to replay what you see in the log and trying to record how many tokens were missing and, and remaining if we do that. So let's do that in PM4Pi. And it's actually, now you know the back, background, you know, explaining how to do this in PM4Pi is actually almost trivial. Um, because basically, if you have a data frame, Petanet, in the, uh, uh, with an initial and final marking, you can basically invoke PM4Pi.fitness underscore. Somehow the underscores are, are, are missing here, but underscore token, underscore base, underscore replay. And you get this beautiful output here where you see, in this case, I've been using a data frame that had zero problems. So it will tell you that the percentage of fitting traces is 100%. The average fitness, right? I just told you if a trace is no missing and remaining tokens, it has a fitness of one. Uh, so the average fitness obviously one, the log fitness is one. And uh, these are actually some, some, some of these uh, statistics are duplicates, right? The percentage of fitting traces is, a sim is the same as P E R C underscore fit underscore traces. Um, another example is if you would take a data frame which has some problems. So I have some variation of this running example data where I've removed arbitrarily a few events. And if you then use this uh, data frame underscore problems as an input for the same model that I've just shown you with the initial and final marking then um, you'll get different outputs. So you'll get uh, the observation that only 16.6666668%, uh, so 16 to third percent of all traces actually fit. And yet, but the average fitness is still 0 0.8, right? So that's an interesting thing. So sometimes you can have event logs where you have only a small fraction of the traces fit completely. Yet, if you look overall, a much larger fraction of behavior is actually um, fitting. Uh, so what that means is that um, there may be quite a few traces in this example log that just have a few problems. And then only 16 to thirds is completely fitting. Yet you could kind of infer this, this fitness value of 0 0.8 as the overall behavior still fits for roughly 80%. That's how you... Can infer that. If you use other process of modeling formalisms for token based replay, obviously you'll have to convert them simply to Petri nets. Um, right? So we have this process trees. That's another type of formalism that, that you can discover. And again, if you learn such a process tree based on the data, um, you have to convert it to a Petri net. And also, these conversions exist for BPMN models that I've just shown you. And then, uh, yeah, again, you get the same exactly the same uh, output and you see um yeah you can do the same for bpm then the let's say what the token based replay doesn't really capture so much is um diagnostics it doesn't really necessarily tell you which parts of the model have been skipped or which which parts of the log were hard to explain it in fact tries to explain everything in terms of the model which can have problems. So um, there are also diagnostics we can compute based on uh, models and um, event data. Um, so again, I'm going to uh, show you some uh, examples uh, of 
uh, how to compute diagnostics of these types of models. And for this, we use the concept of alignments. Um, so what is the general idea of alignments? Um, opposed to this uh, token-based replay, which in a way heuristically tries to fit everything that we see in the data uh, in the model, uh, an alignment actually does something different. So an alignment tries to find the uh, behavior that is in the model, uh, firing sequence, if you like, so a sequence of activities in the model that is as close as possible to the behavior that we see. Right. So, for example, uh, you see an example here of an alignment where we have a trace. This this first uh, artifact here is a trace. Um, the second artifact here is the alignment of the trace. So how should you infer this? Um, the trace says that there's a register request, then examine casually, a check ticket, a decide, and a reject request. This is behavior that fits the model because there's a firing sequence. And in this case, I'm showing you a BPMN model, but of course, for Petty, it's the same, same thing. But in this BPMN model, for example, indeed, we can first do the register request then the examine casually and check ticket. They are in parallel, so they can happen in any order. Then we can do a decision and then we do a reject request. So there is a firing sequence in this particular process model, in this case represented as a BP man, that matches this input sequence here. So um, the alignment will tell us. So how do, you, how, how do we need to read this alignment? This alignment actually maps um, it literally maps the uh, observed behavior onto the model elements. So it maps register requests in the trace onto firing register requests in the model. And that is what you see in the bottom. So if you look at the bottom uh, alignment, you see actually a sequence of pairs where the first uh, element of the pair is actually a representation of what we see in the log. And the second element of the pair is actually uh, referred to as the, 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 the mimic in the model, right? So again, we see we can synchronize the registration of the request in the log with respect to uh, firing it in this model, in this BPMN model. And the same holds for the second uh, element of this alignment. So we see an examine casually. And we see, yes, we can uh, do that in the in the in the in the model as well we see a check ticket same we see check ticket in the trace and we can mimic that in the model we see a decision in the trace and we can mimic that in the model so the whole time the first argument is what we see in the trace the second argument is how we should mimic that into in this beautiful in this model so in a way uh, if you take an alignment and these pairs in in this alignment are referred to as moves if you ignore constantly, and I'm going to try to wipe away my, my lines a bit in this um, example here. Um, if you ignore the second argument uh, of all these pairs, of all these moves, then you get the trace back, right? So if you ignore, um, right? So if you only look at the, the first elements of each move, you see a register request, examine casually, check ticket, decide, reject request. So if I ignore the second element, I, I get uh, exactly the trace back. Um, and if you would ignore the, the, the first element, you would get the firing sequence in the model back, which is exactly the same as the trace. That is why um, these, these two are what we call perfectly aligned. In some cases, we have, let's say we would have a, I'm not sure if I have an example on the next slide, so also draw it here. Let's say we have a decide uh, activity, uh, which is executed twice. That would mean that we could um, map the first execution of the decision. Uh, we could map it onto the model, but then we would have uh, a, a repeated execution of the decide transition. Uh, of the of the decide activity, which is not necessarily described uh, by the model. So there's two options in which we could then uh, treat that second observation of the decide um, activity. We could say this is a problem on the log side. 
we could say, okay, it is uh, occurring twice, but it shouldn't because it should only occur once. So then we would say, okay, we have the decide uh, activity, right? So I'm, I'm assuming here the trace would actually be register, examine casually, check tickets, decide, decide, reject request. And we would sort of have this move where we would say, well, after this first decide, there would be a second decide here which we cannot mimic in the model. And we would say we are not being able to mimic that by means of this symbol that we see here. And then we could again synchronize on the reject request. The alternative explanation would be if we would want to enforce synchronization of the decide um, activity, the alternative would be the second decide uh, activity, the alternative would be that we say, well, we could theoretically again synchronize on the decide but we would have to first of all uh, reinitiate the request r. I will write it like r r. Then we would have to, for example, uh, check the ticket c t, and then we would have to, for example, examine casually or thoroughly. That actually doesn't matter either of all these two. So e c, and then we could again. Uh, synchronize on the decision and then we could proceed with reject. So if we would have a second decide activity after the first decide activity, we could either say, well, we cannot match that in the, uh, in the model. That's the left example here. Or we would say, well, we can match that in the model, but then in the log, we would be actually missing a full fragment of this behavior here. So we, we would be missing a complete reinitiation in this in this data. And in general, when you have moves that are of the form, some activity label A, uh, and then uh, which is cannot be followed by the model, these are referred to as log moves. And the... Um, Alternatives that I've drawn here. So if we cannot mimic something in the model, uh, so these would be typically skip, comma, some transition. Those are model moves. And the moves I've shown so far, where you basically map an activity A on the execution of some transition T, which usually has label A, that is a synchronous transition. And here I have another example of non-fitting behavior with respect to uh, this model, and I hope you still have the model in mind. So we have a register request followed by another register request followed by examine casually, check ticket, reject request. I know the model very well. I know registration of the request can simply never be repeated. Um, and I know a decision here is missing. Um, and also you see that, right? So you see that after synchronization on the first um, register of request here, you see the second register request is by uh, the alignment is not allowed. It says, I see this in the log, right? This is a log move and I cannot replicate it. Note, technical detail, I am totally allowed to swap these moves. It doesn't matter at all. So I can, in this example, I can swap. I can also say the first registration is a uh, log move. The second one is synchronizable. We don't know, it's a decision. We don't know, it doesn't matter in this case. And then finally, we can synchronize on the exam and casually check ticket. And then we have uh, missing the site. So here we say, look, we have a model move. We have a decision that is not there and a rejection. All right. And so to interpret this alignment, the first register request activity is also described by the model. Yet the second register request activity is not described by the model. As I said, the exam and casually is also described by both the log and the model. So is the check ticket. Finally, the decide was not observed in the data, yet the model describes that it should be. So this is an example of how you can read such an alignment and how you can infer diagnostic information out of it. Um, and what's important is, again, if you ignore the first arguments in the alignment, so if I would wipe out the first argument, I'm doing that here in the alignment, um, and then secondly, I would also ignore all the skips in the second argument. So I would also ignore that. What I obtain is the 
model behavior that according to the alignment fits best with respect to the input trace. And that would be reject request followed by examine casually, check ticket followed by decide, followed by check tick, uh, reject request, which you see in the bottom. So that is according to the alignment algorithm, the most logical model behavior that this event trace actually belongs to. Now, uh, what defines um, the most uh, desirable model behavior uh, is usually done by assigning cost function to log and model moves. So usually we say, okay, synchronous moves are desirable. So they are basically for free. They don't cost you anything. But if you decide to inject a model of this, uh, sorry, a move of this form or a move of this form, that will cost you something, right? So typically we would say the cost of the alignment that we see here would be two because there's one model move and one log move. Um, and in general, then given that you have a cost function and you have um, different decisions one can make, it's simply uh, a shortest path algorithm that we need to solve under the hood, but I won't explain that in um, a lot of detail um, here. Um, but obviously you can play also with the uh, this cost function. So if you would say, I find log moves much more problematic than model moves for whatever reason, uh, then you'll see you'll get different, uh, you can potentially get different explanations of the traits. So let's compute some alignments in PM4Pi, which is again, compared to token-based replay also, is very straightforward to do. It's nothing um, challenging about it actually. Um, if you want to have diagnostics, you can learn a petty net, and then you can essentially uh, compute the uh, diagnostics by typing pm4pi.conformance underscore diagnostics underscore alignments. And you give in your data frame in this case, I give in the DF underscore problems you give in your model. And you see literally that uh, it is going to give us the alignments of all these individual traces that are in the data. And you can see it's using, people is using the exact same representation as I've just shown you, right? So here you see the actual alignment. So you can really obtain this diagnostic information. And you can quite easily, if you have the alignment, you can quite easily reconstruct the original trace and the firing sequence. So for example, you can easily um, reconstruct that this first trace, uh, again, I just have to ignore this uh, first element, this and, um, sorry, uh, I have to ignore the second element to get the trace, right? And also ignore the skips to get the trace back. The none actually refers to these invisible transitions, which you can never map on any observation. So, um, the first trace actually is examine thoroughly, check ticket, decide, reject request. Now, obviously, the alignment is a list of pairs in 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 uh, in Python. So you can use simply a map function and a filter function to actually obtain literally the sequence of activities back. Similarly, if you want to know the um, underlying um, uh, firing sequence, you have to drop these um, the first elements, right? Um, you should not drop the none as these are, what I will show here is the labels of the transitions actually. So in fact, this says that, okay, you first fire the transition register request then you fire this invisible transition. That's why it has no label none. Then the, the transition carrying the label examine thoroughly, check ticket, decide and again, invisible transition and reject request. So in a way we make the invisible transitions visible to some degree. Um, and you can get again, all kinds of interesting uh, information. You actually get uh, statistic information about the complexity of the underlying search problem. If, if you would be interested, uh, it uses uh, linear programming in the backend. So you get the number of linear programs that were solved. Um, you get the costs. And what's very important to realize is the cost. Um, you should read this as cost is one. So it, it tells us it cost uh, 1002. How you should infer that is this two represents the two transitions that uh, the two invisible transitions, they are 
technically model moves, but they should be for free because they're invisible. So we can never map anything anyways. Um, and there's uh, one model move in this trace, right? So um, the model moves in, and the log moves are counted actually as a cost 10,000. And the invisible moves uh, are cost as a cost are uh, used as a cost one. That enforces that we only use uh, invisible transitions when we really, really need them. And uh, there's a bit more technicalities behind that I'm not going to explain. Um, also, again, we have some notion of fitness uh, for this uh, specific um, trace and alignment. Um, you can also get more global statistics, so no diagnostics uh, for these alignments um, by applying pm5.fitness uh, underscore alignments. And then you get, again, percentage of fitting traces, average fitness, etc. And you notice that with the same model as I've used before and the same problematic data set, you do notice that the percentage of fitting trace is exactly the same as token-based replay, but the fitness is slightly different. So there's slight variations in the way in which we compute the quantification of the fitness. Okay, so that was it for um, conformance checking in uh, pm 4 pi um, In our documentation, we'll also report on more functions that are available in pm 4 pi for uh, applying conformance checking, but these would be the basics of doing that. So thanks for watching and I hope to see you in the next tutorial.